Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Michelle Pettit. I am the FBA president this year, and I welcome you all to our annual civics contest event. Um, what we try to do every year is with the Ninth Circuit Civics Contest, we take the theme that they are using for the civics contest and do a program that we can record for the students and also educate our own uh, practitioners here in the federal bar. Um, I just want to put one big quick plug for our Federal Bar Association. We're doing a lot of great stuff this year. We're going to be starting a trial series, a four-part series, at the end of next month. And so I hope all of you will come out for that. And uh, we've got some really great things that are going to be going on this year. So I hope everyone becomes members if you're not already. With that, I want to introduce uh, Judge Kathy Ann Bichbingo. She has been in our court system for many years as a magistrate judge and now as a district court judge. And I'm going to let her do the honors of introducing the panelists. All right, thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the presentation on the Fourth Amendment in the 21st century. Thank you to the Federal Bar Association for hosting today's program. It's intended in part to support the Courts and Community Committee of the Ninth Circuit's annual essay and video contest for high school students. Each year, the committee sponsors a circuit-wide competition in which high school students are invited to reflect on a constitutional or other legal issue and how it impacts their lives. Participating students learn about the law, its history, and the role of the judiciary in the interpretation and application of the law. Students have submitted thoughtful and often moving essays and videos about such topics as the Fifth Amendment's right against self-incrimination, and the 14th Amendment's right to equal protection under the law in public education. And if the um, invaluable and, and, and you know, per, uh, benefit of just learning isn't enough, there's also monetary awards uh, tied to this for the high school students. So that's another incentive. The topic for this year's contest focuses on the Fourth Amendment's protection against unreasonable searches and seizures and asks, what is an unreasonable search and seizure in the digital age? The speakers today, Ninth Circuit Judge John Owens and USD School of Law Professor John Drips, will provide some historical background of the Fourth Amendment and discuss some recent United States Supreme Court decisions that are providing the current framework as to what is reasonable when it comes to new technology and the information we generate every day about ourselves and our movements. Data collection is one of the fastest growing markets in the world. Information about you, about who you talk to, what you watch, what you buy, where you go, how you got there, how long you stayed, about your health, your DNA results, your financial status, and more is collected every day sometimes with our knowledge and sometimes without. It's stored, it's analyzed, and it's sold regularly. Who can access that information and how is getting more and more attention as we all come to realize how much we consider private is out there and can be obtained and recovered. Our speakers for this program, as I mentioned, are the Honorable John D. Owens. He serves on the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Prior to becoming a federal judge in 2014, he was a partner at Munger, Tolls, and Olson, where he focused on white-collar investigations and appellate matters. A federal prosecutor for more than 11 years in Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and San Diego. He served as chief of the criminal division in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of California and received two director's awards for his work there. The television show American Greed featured two of his prosecutions, and he obtained the longest sentence for a white-collar defendant in the history of the Southern District of California in United States versus Pacal. John Owens, uh, Judge Owens graduated first in his class from Stanford Law School in 1996, where he was the executive editor of the Stanford Law Review. After graduation, he served as a law clerk for the Honorable J. Clifford Wallace of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and for the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the Supreme Court of the United States. His written work has appeared in the California Law Review, the UCLA Law Review, the Northwestern Review, and other law reviews. Professor uh, Donald Drips is a, a joined the USD School of Law faculty in 2004. He is a graduate of Northwestern University for his BA at the University of Michigan, go blue, for his JD in 1983. Uh, Judge Drips uh, specializes in federal courts, constitutional interpretation, criminal law and criminal procedure, constitutional law, administrative law, and evidence. He clerked for the Honorable Amelia 
peers in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City. He was an assistant professor at the University of Illinois College of Law, a visiting professor at Duke University Law School, a visiting professor at Cornell University Law School, and the James Annenberg Levi Professor of Criminal Procedure at the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, professor Drips was the editor-in-chief of the Michigan Law Review and is a member of the Order of McCoy. Among many of his scholarly works, uh, he authored Dearest Property, Digital Evidence in the History of Private Papers as Special Objects of Search and Seizure in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology in 2013. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. I'll turn the program over to Judge Owens, who I believe will be leading off our discussion. If you have questions, please hold them for the end, and then we'll be happy to take questions time permitting. Great, thank you very much for the introduction. And yes, we're going to be talking about the Fourth Amendment in the digital age. Obviously, as a sitting judge, I can speak about some things, and there's some things I cannot speak about. Uh, like, why did you come up with that ruling in that case? I can't answer. But I think I can get us started talking about where the doctrine currently is. So we have a pretty good audience here today. For those of you who are not prosecutors, I'm going to direct this question to you. So if you're not a prosecutor, and you wanted to investigate a crime, figure out what someone had just done in the past week or what might be doing the next week, what are some of the places you might want to look? Don't raise your hands. Was that cell phone? Cell phone, sure. What else? Google. Their Google use of the internet usage, okay. What else? Credit cards. Credit cards, that was my favorite as a prosecutor, yes. Their computer. Maybe they're from the old days in the 80s, they're trash. They're on a trash run. Uh, anything else? Social media, right? Maybe where their car went, where their car's been. Right, fast pass. Well, these are all things we use. And so what we wanted to do today was talk about, obviously their house is probably a good place to start too. Uh, we wanted to talk about some of the things that investigators would typically look at and then talk about how there have been some significant changes in the last, what you say, Professor, five years? These uh, digital cases, I would guess you want to start with Jones, is that 2013? Yeah, so there have been some huge, huge changes, certainly since I was in law school and we learned about what was called the third party doctrine. Uh, I'll let Professor Drips talk about that. I'm not sure the third party doctrine I learned about in the early 90s is still the one that we have today. So again, places you look, your house, okay, not my house. <laughs> not my house. I don't know why we use this picture, but that's more like a mansion. Uh, of course, you got your emails, right? Very valuable. Not as valuable, at least for younger kids these days. Social media for younger kids is where you really want to find the information. Uh, you can see all the different forms there. Uh, we talked about cell phones, automobile. You think of all the stuff you have in your eye. If, you're not, if you don't have a clean car like me, there's all kinds of receipts, there's all kinds of junk. You can imagine what you can learn about someone in that context. Again, not my car. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned we can track where it goes, also what's inside of the car. <coughs> trash cams, be amazed what you can find about someone going through their trash. And credit cards and phone records. So, why don't we go ahead and start with, there, the, I was a prosecutor once upon a time, so you have to always have these pictures in your opening statement, you know, these, these kind of uh, over the top pictures, credit cards, if they can look like the guy did something really bad. Uh, so, Fourth Amendment, the text. Now, Professor Drips, you always talk about read the text first, <laughs> start there. I, I think we're familiar with the text, but why don't we talk about, in this context, in the context of searching things, what language in the amendment, often we think we know what it says, but what is the language we should be paying attention to? But that depends. Um, so uh, this, the credit card cases um, uh, are, are, are very much um, a good example of the difference of viewpoint that Professor Tony Amsterdam talked about uh, the difference between uh, taking an atomistic view of the Fourth Amendment and focusing on persons, houses, papers, and effects, the individual, uh, or taking a view of, of regulating the police who didn't exist in 1791 and making sure that all of us can live uh, with a decent, uh, with, with, uh, with a police force that observes basic decencies in law enforcement, that right of the people to be secure. Uh, and that, if you emphasize that language, that's one kind of language if you look at um, the person's houses, papers, and effects, that's another kind of language. So with respect to credit cards, when you start, you don't even need a search warrant. You just use a subpoena to the, to the 
bank company, that's the Miller case, um, and what has been done to the consumer? You haven't kicked his doors in, um, you haven't uh, uh, walked on, on his house, you haven't planted a tracker on his car, um, you haven't done any of the traditional kinds of, of trespassory intrusions that were familiar to the founders of the Constitution when you've done that, but what you have done uh, is developed, uh, started to develop a digital dossier on that person, um, uh, which which enables the government to know a great deal more about the individual than the individual might suspect is, is easily available. Uh, and, and it might be that you're concerned about that kind of uh, 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 informational privacy, quite aside from the security of the home and the security against arbitrary arrest. So when we go through our list here today, we talked about, and this is like this is in there for, for high school students who are watching this, remember if you're in high school, all these Fourth Amendment rights, very different in the school con, uh, con, context. Please don't think that your parents can't search your phone. Please don't think your parents can't search your room. Um, that often happens in these presentations. They come home and say, guess what? You can't do mom and dad. And that's, that's not the case. Uh, so look, searching a house, I think everyone's familiar. That has not changed. Uh, again, prosecutor putting the, the picture and makes someone look bad. Uh, but generally speaking, just a reminder, just search that. When they say house, it does not literally have to be a house you own. It can be an apartment, a townhouse. You don't people rent there. You don't have to own the building. This is all pretty basic for you guys. A, a warrant is required. Uh, now, let's talk about a couple concepts here. Probable cause and things to be seized. Now, Professor Drips, uh, sometimes new prosecutors or new law students in U.S. attorney's offices say, well, what's the definition of probable cause? Is that written down somewhere? Can I, can I see what that is? Like a test. In law school, we learn a lot of tests. So what is the test of probable cause? So what do you tell your students is probable cause? I say there are easy cases each way, no probable cause, um, a clear probable cause. I give them the JL case, which is the uh, stop and frisk case where the uncorroborated anonymous tip doesn't even rise to the level of the Terry test. So clearly that kind of thing is not probable cause. Um, and you know, at the other end of the spectrum, there are easy cases for probable cause. If one citizen accuses another of committing a crime, uh, a person who's known to the victim, that's enough to take the case to trial because credibility is for the jury. So, so a case of someone accusing someone else of, of having raped them or robbed them, uh, that's probable cause to make the arrest. Uh, if the uh, informant goes into the house um, with money and no drugs and comes out with drugs and no money, that's probable cause. Um, uh, so there, you know, most of the cases that, that come up in day-to-day -day law enforcement are not that difficult about probable cause, but there's lots of stuff in between that can be very, very difficult, uh, particularly with how much time has passed since you bought the drugs. Are the drugs still there? Are the stolen goods still there? How long do money, drugs, uh, and that sort of stolen goods, how long do they stay in one place for the warrant to issue? Those kinds of questions. So one thing also that I, to remind people is the warrant requirement is not just probable cause, but things to be seized. And it's very important that the warrant actually be specific as to what is seized. You, there are lots of cases in the 70s and 80s where the prosecutor said, we want to search for everything. And a warrant was issued, let's say everything. And then, no, no, you have to be a little more specific than that. The challenge, though, is that, like you say, you can't search everywhere for everything. But the challenge is, is that if you're looking for something small, like a thumb drive, you can search pretty much anywhere. So as a prosecutor, obviously, you think, look for things small. Uh, but as a defense attorney, you have to make sure that, it, that you can do that. Now, I, I see uh, Bob Chiaffa out here in the audience. Bob was a prosecutor in Florida during the 80s. And, Don't take me, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think uh, Bob, Bob once upon a time, was my boss in the US Attorney's Office. And he told me about how during the 80s, you would have agents breaking open safes, floorboards, boats, all kinds of crazy things to find something because it was within the scope of the warrant. It was particularly described. That was a different day we started. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Emails. Now, now we're going to get started where things are a little harder. For the longest time, uh, whether or not you needed a warrant to search for emails depended on whether the emails were opened or not and whether they were 180 days old or not. And there was an order, I think it's called this uh, 2703D order, if I remember this correctly? It's been a while. Where you could get someone's emails if they fell into those categories without a search warrant. And that was done for many, many, many years. But then over time, I think more and more courts got a little queasy about that practice and it's been cut back. So I want to 
turn this over to Professor Drips. There's a Sixth Circuit case, I think, that's kind of, is it the Warshak case? Warshak case, yeah, it was the inside fraud case. Um, and uh, uh, it was a case that, that case raised the question of whether emails that were outside the six-month limit in the Stored Communications Act could be reached with a warrant, whether that was constitutional or not. So the Stored Communication Act was adopted in 1986 at a time when uh, storage costs for uh, computing services were still very high. And the ISPs, the service providers, were flushing their data uh, at six-month intervals. So the assumption was that if you needed a warrant to get um, an email that was within the six-month period, um, uh, you, you needed a warrant to do that. But there weren't going to be any uh, emails stored longer than that. And of course, the price of storage just kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And so the, the, the Stored Communications Act is very badly out of date on that front, and it raises the constitutional question. The Warshak case said, well, it's a communication, and the service provider is not an intended recipient of that. Uh, and and it's, just a, it's just a medium. Um, and in the, in the uh, Carpenter case that we're all talking about now, there are multiple favorable references to the Warshak case. There's a favorable reference in the majority opinion. There's a favorable uh, reference uh, in um, uh, Ju Justice Kennedy's dissenting opinion. Uh, only uh, Justice Thomas, who wants to get rid of the Katz formula altogether, uh, didn't have something kind to say about the Warshak case. So at this point, I'm, I'm inclined to say that uh, it would you, you would be skating on very thin ice to ask for, a war uh, for to, to proceed with a subpoena to get email content. Um, you, you do need to remember a distinction between envelope information and content information. Uh, so that uh, uh, in, in the um, uh, uh, Smith case, which was the pen register case, uh, the court was in trouble back in the 70s by giving the government the identity of the numbers um, uh, that were being called uh, or with a tap, trap and trace device that records the numbers from incoming calls. Uh, and so because that isn't really the communication, that's just who you're talking to. Um, there's a, some concern now about uh, just how much uh, government can learn about you from that en envelope information. It's not just the postal worker who sees the letter. It's the NSA with their data mining program that can connect you to every person you communicate with and every person they communicate with. Uh, and you can build up a pretty powerful uh, database on people just with envelope information. But at the moment, that's not constitutionally um, uh, uh, required. It's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting test case on legislation versus courts. Um, uh, Congress has not revisited this subject and is well overdue for doing that. On the other hand, here in California, our legislature just adopted a comprehensive privacy protection uh, act uh, spurred largely by tech industries up north, and so the politics of it are a little different than they are inside the Beltway. But the, the California Act requires warrants to get uh, envelope information uh, as well as content information uh, right. as well as location data. For our, our potential student audience, um, uh, some of this, I think, has to come back to the fundamental principle for them of what's your expectation of privacy uh, in terms of what you're looking at. Because um, I think most people would understand that if I write a letter and I stick it in an envelope and I seal it and I put it in the mail, my expectation is nobody but the recipient is going to open that envelope and read the content, even though a number of people may handle it from the you know, snail mail as a concept maybe our student audience won't quite grasp. They're doing, they're not even doing emails, they're doing Instagram, but but what they're sending is available to be read by people along the way who are handling the information, and yet there is clearly still an expectation of privacy in the content. And isn't that the point here? Well, that was, it, 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 so if you take the third party doctrine seriously, when you subpoena the text message from Verizon, Right? You haven't done anything to either party to the text message. Right? You haven't intruded on their property rights. You haven't taken them into custody. You haven't invaded their house or stopped their car. Um, what you've done is, is, is take information from a third-party custodian of that information. And the Smith and Miller cases say that if, when that's a phone company or a credit card company, that's fine. The consumer can't complain about that. Warshak case said that when you get the content, the consumer can complain about that, that you don't lose your REP in the communication um, uh, just because you've got an intermediate print. The very fact is, it, it, we think these cases are new, um, but when Western Union came on the scene in the late 19th century, it was precisely the same problem because the Western Union operator had to have a copy of the message to translate it into Old Morse, 
and then Western Union retained those copies of those messages to make sure they couldn't be sued for mistransmitting the information and so on. So the content of the messages was in the hands of the telegraph company, unlike snail mail, which had been the previous technology. And there were cases um, never reaching the Supreme Court in which the federal judges said that a subpoena will do the work here to get the messages uh, about uh, anarchist slaver organizers, however you want to characterize them, um, and uh, uh, that you could get the, the, the messages from Western Union. But Judge Cooley, the greatest constitutional commentator of the time, said that was outrageous and, and, and spoke in his treatise on the constitutional limitations very much like the Warshak case um, more than 100 years later. So, so um, technology... You know, changes in a way. Does it does it does it follow that our expectations of privacy um, can be translated from snail mail to telegraph, from telegraph to text message, from text message to email? That's the challenge the courts have to work with now. Uh, one thing that's interesting is when you actually get a warrant for an email, who do you serve it on? Where does it go? And many warrants, there's actually a provision in the code saying if, you have, if you're a court in San Diego, you can issue a warrant out of your district to usually the northern district, which is where a lot of these email servers are kept. So they have huge departments that run these things. But there's the new Cloud Act, and I don't know, Professor Drips, if you're, if you're familiar with that or can talk about that, it gets really complicated when their email server's overseas. Yeah, I know the Microsoft case, but I think that this Congress done something. Uh... I, I, I'm looking at that. Michelle Pettit, they passed the Cloud Act. I don't there's, has there been any significant litigation over the Cloud Act yet? I, I don't believe so, but now you can get, as long, as long as there's a server in the United States, then you're gonna be able to get the information from the provider that is a U.S. company. If it is a foreign company with foreign servers, you're not, you're still not gonna get that information. So the whole idea of the cloud and where data is really kept it can be very metaphysical to understand where exactly the information it makes the whole search warrant concept a little difficult to apply. I mean, it, it sometimes we sight of the fact of what warrants actually do and what they always have done, which is protect the officer from liability. Uh, if the author of the warrant, I'm not sure, high school students have not, never have even seen a warrant. A warrant's a court order to go to the place to be searched and come back with the stuff if you find it. And you can't be sued for violating a court order, right? Um, even if it would be otherwise trespass or false imprisonment or whatever. And so what the founders were concerned about was was uh, this new Congress was going to raise money by import duties, and they were concerned that, that Congress would have an incentive to immunize by statute with general warrants or writs of assistance its revenue collectors against state tort suits. Um, and how that works with a third-party custodian of uh, electronic data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so... so uh, the whole idea of what would be, I'm, not, I'm not even sure what a, you wouldn't send a search team with the warrant. You just present the warrant to the ISP and assume that the ISP would give you the stuff that you wanted. So the difference in function between a warrant and a subpoena here is very, very hard to figure out. Um, uh, but, you know, what the Carpenter case says, you've got to get a subpoena for certain kinds of data. So, 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 so you've got to get a warrant for certain kinds of data. So, so warrant it is, I guess. Yeah, for those who have served them on ISPs, they're, these days they're, they have a clear process on how they're to proceed. But it is a weird process because you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to send a warrant by email to the email provider, and they will process it. You don't actually present it. Usually you don't have officers go down and present the warrant and knock on the doors of, you know, Sergey at Google and say, give me all your stuff. So it's an, it's an interesting process. All right, to me, this is the biggest issue especially for younger folks and high school students, is social media. Because my daughter, uh, just two weeks ago, she's 14, and we allowed her finally to have an Instagram account. And I've never had social media. My wife has never had social media. So we have seen a lot of stuff on Instagram and a lot of her friends doing some pretty interesting things that we've never seen before. Uh, we tell her, you know, flipping the bird at the camera and taking a picture and put on Instagram is not smart long-term kid. Thank God that was not my daughter. Uh, it was one of her friends. So social media. Okay, the first thing is, okay, public social media is totally fair game. And when you're working on a criminal investigation, it is amazing how much you learn about people through public social media. Throwing gang signs with money and guns behind you. I mean, it's just, it's, it's incredible what you can learn. Uh, and especially for younger people out there, just remember someone could be watching this, law enforcement, and learn a lot about what you're doing. In fraud cases, posing in front of all the cars you just bought based on the investor money, 
That's great evidence. There's fantastic evidence to put an opening statement. But I think what people also don't understand is they say, well, my settings were private. Okay, my settings were private. So the government can't get it. Well, that's not really true if you share it with friends. Right? If you have a private messaging with a friend and they decide to give it to the police, it's fair game. There's no warrant required if they're, if they're cooperating with the authorities. And you can think of a typical situation where if you have people 17, 18 years old engaged in bad behavior and the police show up at one person's house, they say, I understand you've been doing some bad stuff with your friend Frank. We were looking at Frank. Mom and dad are going to tell the police, give them your phone right now. Just give it to them. They're going to give the police the phone. They're going to see everything Frank was doing. Even though Frank always thought it was private, and he had his privacy settings, he has essentially given it to the world as long as he shares it with another person, so long as that other person consents to it. I think people often don't realize with social media, once it's out there, it's, it's really out there. I think the next question, though, is what if it's purely private social media? That's something either there's not consent by, a, by another person, or something that you're just doing on your own, an internal Facebook posting that you're working on. And that... That just seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> private social media. Well, to give you an example, uh, there is, a, there is a, a program called Episodes that young people like to write on. And there's a setting where you can write your stories and then, bef then you can turn it public. But before you turn it public, you are writing stories on some third-party website and you may have all kinds of strange things in those stories. And that's one where it's not actually released to the public yet, but it could have evidentiary value. Um, but you still need a search warrant to get that kind of stuff. Now, Professor Drips, the world of social media, you, your students at USD, is this a bigger concern from them than maybe what I would be more concerned about, like a search of my house? It's a, I think the, the questions here, the legal questions here are easy, right? I mean, it was a hard question back in the 1970s as to whether you could have a secret agent, you know, insinuate himself into the suspect's inner circle, and then if, you, if secret agents were okay, is it okay to wire them for sound? And now people don't need secret agents or, or hidden microphones to record electronically their their their, their private behavior. It, it, so the change here is sociological; it's not legal. Um, and it, 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 it's a recurring theme in some of the literature in this area about how much of the work of preserving a free society gets done by informational privacy and how much of it gets done by substantive tolerance. So when I think about Justice Sotomayor's concurrence uh, in the Jones case, and she talks about all the sensitive locations you might visit, um, the gay bar, uh, the Communist Party meeting, the psychiatrist, the criminal defense lawyer, uh, the family planning, aka abortion clinic, and so on. All of that is now substantively protected by the Constitution. Um, uh, the re reproductive freedom, uh, uh, sexual orientation, uh, non-discrimination, um, uh, protection of extreme uh, political speech, uh, all of that stuff is now protected by other amendments, and so much of the work that used to be done by privacy uh, is now being done by substantive notions of tolerance and liberty, and, and where that will go long term, it may be that, that uh, uh, your grandchildren won't know what privacy is. Um, uh, who, cares, who cares if other people know what I'm doing because I'm not doing anything wrong, and to the extent they think it's wrong, I'm going to have a constitutional a legal entitlement to, to disagree with them. Certainly, Jed, being, when I was in high school, I ne can never imagine anything uh, like this, what kids see today. Uh, cell phones. So, uh, I wanted to give Professor Drips a good opportunity to talk about the Riley case, because that case came from San Diego. Yes. And that's a big, big, big case. Um, so we all watched this very, very closely. Um, they took two cases. They took uh, Riley against California, which was a state case, and, and under the Diaz decision, um, Riley clearly lost uh, because of the. Is, is that right? I'm trying to. It was an interesting question about the timing of the case, right? So, so the, I think I think Riley's case, um, the facts came up before the Diaz decision, so it wasn't a retroactivity Davis kind of situation. Um, but after the Diaz decision, his appeal was was a dead duck. Um, on, 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 in, the, in the state courts. Worry in, in uh, the Sixth Circuit had been a case of first impression there. They had not dealt with the search incident doctrine um, uh, uh, with respect to cell phones in the Sixth Circuit at that, at that point in time. So these were cases that the Supreme Court could take as, as they were live cases, right? Um, uh, uh, because there was not a retroactivity problem. Uh, 
So the, the, the prior search incident to arrest doctrine, and here, you know, there's another recurring theme in these cases, to what extent do we want to rely on rules and to what extent do we want to rely on standards. And during the 1980s, the Supreme Court, and, and Chief Justice Roberts' opinion is a great teaching tool in this, it goes through the search incident cases from the 70s and 80s uh, and lays them out very clearly. If the suspect is arrested in public space, his entire person can be searched, not just the pat down, but, but reaching into pockets and, and, and inventorying all of his belongings and opening the briefcase and the backpack and so on. Uh, thorough search of the person for any and all effects. No effects are more or less private than the others. If the search is in a car, uh, that was first the Belton rule and now uh, the Gantt rule, which authorizes a search of the passenger compartment of the car for officer safety, at least until the suspect is detained in the back of the patrol car. Um, or at least handcuffed and remote from the vehicle, or on a search for evidence with little, less than probable cause, more than nothing less than probable cause, if they think that evidence of the crime of arrest might be uh, in, the, in the passenger compartment. Um, uh, and then when the arrest is indoors, the Schimmel test is the grab range test, so uh, if the suspect is, is awakened in the middle of the night, uh, the police can search the bedroom bureau because if there is a pistol in the room, that's where it's going to be. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the Riley court uh, said that that line does not extend to digital devices and distinguish digital storage devices of which the images on, on Riley's phone were an example. It, for purposes of the Riley case, it, it's not a communications device, it's just a digital storage device. Uh, and simply by, by, by virtue of the amount and type of information it can and typically does contain, the cell phone is categorically more different than other kinds of personal effects. So this example is the one I give uh, in class if um, your grandmother is arrested for missing a court date, a bench warrant issue, she's taken into custody, and the police arrest her, they can thoroughly search her person, and if in her purse they find a little notebook which says, um, uh, letters to God, my personal prayer journal, the police can open that and search it without a warrant, even though the offense of arrest is nothing to do with, with no conceivable evidence could be found of the, the offense of missing a court date, right? Um, but the rule is a rule. We need bright line rules. We have 10 million arrests every year in this country, and the police need standardized procedures. That's a very, very important interest, too. Uh, by contrast, um, uh, the suspect could be uh, in the business of drug dealing or distributing child pornography. That could be the offense of arrest. And, and when those are the offenses of arrest, it's very, very likely that some kind of evidence of the crime of arrest is going to be on the cell phone. But for that, you need a warrant. So the, so the prayer journal, no warrant. The drug dealer's cell phone, yes, you need a warrant. What explains that? Well, um, uh, we need to have a standardized procedure, and, and speaking in very broad terms, categorically speaking, more, more, more times than not, the cell phone is going to be a lot more private than what's in the purse. Uh, and that, I think, is the gist of the right and, and you see the language here on the screen from the chief, uh, who basically said what Professor Drips just said. Uh, you can read it there. It's um, the privacies of life. They're not just another technological convenience. So it's, and basically, cell phones are just modern cell phones are just different. Is that what you would say? I I, I call it DDD. The digital is different doctrine, um, uh, and I I think it, it it's not just cell phones. I think it's flash drives and tablets and notebooks and anything that has that kind of storage capacity um, uh, that will contain personal images, personal communications, um, financial information. The 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 the, the, the all the sort of thing that you would need to carry a file cabinet around on your back back in the day. Uh, that's the kind of information that is being protected here. And so I don't think, it's not just cell phone specific, I think it's to any digital storage device. And I haven't seen a case yet that draws a distinction and says, oh yeah, the flash drives are fine. Um, uh, there may be one, but I haven't seen it. Well, so I candidly was not surprised by the Riley decision. I was <laughs> surprised by this next decision. And that is Carpenter. First, let's talk a little bit about cell site location information. You probably... Mm -hmm. You see these crime shows, how they can track where the person was by subpoenaing the, I can't do that anymore, but in the, back, the old days you would subpoena the phone company, Sprint, Verizon, whoever it is, and they could tell you where that phone was. Now there's a big debate over how accurate that information is, and there are experts who say that's a bunch of nonsense, this, this CSLI doesn't tell you anything, but it's been used in many, many criminal cases, I used it in some of mine. Um, so it's a very useful tool to trying to figure out where someone was at a certain amount of time. For the longest time, you got that information not with a warrant. Uh, and now you need a warrant. And this was a very, would you say, fair to say, contentious decision? Well, it's, it's not just the whether the location data 
triggers a warrant requirement. That wasn't, you know, it was very, very unclear just when the aggregation of location data in the Jones case would require a warrant when it wouldn't. But on top of that, in the Riley case, it's Riley's cell phone, and he's under arrest. Um, uh, in, in Jones, it's his car, and the tracking device has been put by the police on his car without his consent. Here, the information didn't come from Timothy Ivory Carpenter. It came from Verizon. And, and the government's actions in this case didn't... Carpenter would, was never even aware that this took place. Um, uh, uh, and, and if there were litigation between Verizon and, and, and uh, the, the U.S., uh, he would not have had the right to intervene, at least before the Supreme Court's decision in this case. So it's not just a question about location data, it's a question about third-party records. Um, and, and that had been a very robust doctrine under the Smith and Miller cases, the credit card cases and the, the pen register cases, the envelope information cases, and so on. But that doctrine is now um, uh, not so robust. Yeah, well, here's what the Supreme Court said about it, about the topic of seismic shifts in digital technology. And they talk about how it's different than the nosy neighbor. I have to say, I was surprised, because maybe because I grew up in a time of the third party doctrine, where I think credit card records, and we'll get to those, credit card records in my mind reveal far more about a person than where their car was. Uh, credit card records show you what they're actually doing with their money. And if, you know, like on my phone, my wife has the Starbucks app, right? And every time she goes there, it bing, bing, bing on my phone, and I can see when she's, when she's gonna be there because she's using her credit card or her credit cards being used. Uh, I keep telling her, you know, 550 for a cup, but anyway. Um, <laughs> you can learn a lot from the financials, and that's why I was surprised. I, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna opine on what the next step is, that's what the professor's here to do, but I will say, it's, in my mind, it's tough to draw a line. If, if this requires a warrant, then what about credit cards and phone records and all the other stuff when I used to do routinely? Uh, like that, you mentioned that Cal case. You know, what we did in Cal was we dropped subpoenas on all those credit cards we could find. We found all kinds of great stuff. I think I saw Joe Rabona here. Is Joe here? Yeah, Joe, you remember, we, we found out how we found out about his watch. He, he had a Bentley car, which was great evidence in a fraud case because he was using the money to drive around this Bentley. And what we didn't know was that he had a, a, a watch that matched the Bentley. And it was a Breitling Bentley watch. So, you know, we made all kinds of hoot and holler before the jury about that, you know, $7,000 watch. We had no idea he even owned it until we dropped, we, we, we got the credit card statements out, we found it, but what is this thing? We subpoenaed the jewelry store and they turned in the records and lo and behold, that's what, so of course, we had the jewelry store guy come in and talk about the watch and all that. Um, but it was very, very, very helpful information and I never thought twice I would need something more than a subpoena. If I had to get a warrant for that, I probably wouldn't even look for it, quite honestly. So when you're talking in this case about the limited types of personal in information addressed in previous cases and distinguishing where your phone's been for the last month, they don't even know if you were holding it. Right. Uh, they found this to be much a seismic shift. That's interesting. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Isn't the focus, though, supposed to be not on how Oh, well, look, as a prosecutor, you also have to think about how much time am I going to spend on something, right? So, yes, if I think there's an, if there's an easy way to get evidence that I think is going to be valuable, I'm going to be much more likely to do that than take a really hard thing to get evidence. Right, but isn't that the whole reason there's an evidence, so that you can't do that? Well, well, it depends. It depends. I mean, the, the executive branch has a job of trying to investigate crimes, and it's up to the courts and Congress to decide what they need to do to get that evidence. If there's something called the third party doctrine, then it's just a subpoena required. I don't see why a prosecutor would go out and get a search warrant if it's clear the law only requires a subpoena. I don't think that's a good use of prosecutorial resources. Right, but we're talking about technology catching up and changing some of those procedures. And so it seems to me that you can't really talk about what used to be done easily or more difficultly unless you also examine it in the context of trying to interpret the Fourth Amendment in light of all of the advances in 
Oh, sure, sure. No, I, I don't disagree with that. I guess the point, though, is that the question is where is that line in the age of digital when you have, why is the Supreme Court treating cell site location information at such a high level when in the previous cases it treated credit cards at a very low level? I was flabbergasted by that language about we declined to extend Smith and Miller. I didn't see how um, a, a, a carpenter could win if those cases remained the law. Um, and I, you know, a landline in 1979 was every bit as essential as a cell phone is today. How did you call the police? How did you call an ambulance? How did you call the fire department? Uh, you could not function without it. Well, in, in that day and age, yeah, uh, maybe you could get by without a credit card, but you couldn't get by without a landline, not, not a, be a functioning member of the economic order. Um, uh, and so I was really quite, uh, uh, you know, sort of, Struck speechless for a law professor is really quite something. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, uh, the, another thing that's changed here um, is is the ability to aggregate this information quickly and cheaply. Back in the day, back in, in, in Smith and Miller day, an agent had to look at microfilm, uh, paper records of these credit card transactions. Uh, it was, as you say, a very labor intensive process. And one of the ways warrants protect privacy is by making it expensive. It's an expensive, time, costly hoop that the government has to jump through to get to the most sensitive uh, and private information. Uh, but nowadays, it's point and click. Uh, they have an algorithm that will find the records that they're interested in, uh, and, and the agent can be playing mini golf while, while the algorithm does the work and pulls up all this stuff in a nice, usable format. Uh, zero cost uh, in, in resources. So the ability to aggregate this information, what the literature that calls the mosaic theory, any one piece of this isn't private. Anyone could see where your car is parked on any given day. But when that information is aggregated a thousandfold, it tells us an awful lot about your life, even though no single snapshot is very informative. So I think that my takeaway, at least from, from this whole case, is that a lot, the Supreme Court needs to provide a lot more guidance. Because again, as the professor said, how, how do you say Miller is still good law, and, and we can read it just like it, nothing changed and compare it with Carpenter. If, if, if we're you know, down, down one floor below Olympus, they said we declined to extend. That means they didn't overrule it, and, and the, new, the new cases are different. So good luck to you. This is another, you come back to uh, differences be, between courts and legislatures. Legislatures have political uh, agency problems. They, they're not very typically very sen sensitive to poor people or racial minorities. Once in a while, you get the Rodney King law if there's a spasm of public passion about it. But, but for the most part, they're just not very interested in the civil liberties, at least of the underclass. Um, uh, but, but digital technology is different. This is, this is the, like Justice Alito and his compact disks. You know, people, people like us care about this kind of, kind of privacy. Um, and so maybe maybe legislatures can do something about that, like the California court. But we've been waiting. Uh, the SCA was adopted in 1986. We've been waiting for this for a long time. So well, on the other hand, what about courts? It takes a long time to get the right case. When you do, you get a committee decision um, by a committee whose personnel is constantly changing, that's limited to the particular facts at hand. Uh, and so you, you get this common law method with constitutional law output. Uh, and it leaves you just, just so here, here, how about this one? So um, the, the agent need a drone to follow the suspect's car for three days. Do I have drones coming up here? I got cars. I'm not sure I have drones. So, so, so after Carpenter, I think the answer to that is yes, because, because whether it's seven days or three days of site location in the Carpenter case, they say, <laughs> seven days or three days, whatever it is, it's enough to trigger the warrant requirement. So for the drone, you need, um, you need a, what about uh, sticking a piece of reflective tape on the bumper so the agent can follow it a little better at night? You need a warrant for that under the Jones case because that's a trespass. Okay. So when I put flyers on cars for my uh, daughter's basketball league? That's a trespass. All right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, I trespassed about 400 times then. <laughs> Sorry if you live in Scripps Ranch, I was uh, responsible for that. I didn't say what the damages would be. All right. Uh, all right, let's talk about cars. Uh, you've talked about Jones a lot. Uh, let's, uh, that was another case that honestly surprised me when it came out in light of the Caro case, which is the 
Beeper case, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so, I'm talking about this one. So, the, so this is, I, I think you now have five justices on the Supreme Court who endorse this mosaic or aggregation theory because if you put the Sotomayor concurrence in Jones together with the um, uh, uh, Alito concurrence in Jones, you get, you get five justices who think that um, independent of trespass, monitoring this location data requires a warrant, at least when it's for an extended period of time, 28 days in the Jones case. That's come way down since the Carpenter case, which is also location data, which is, depending on how you read the record, three days of location data or seven days of location data. So, so at this point, GPS tracking the car with or without a trespass, call, and no, there's no trespass in the Carpenter case, right? It's all from Verizon. So, so uh, the location data tracking for an extended period of time, now measured in days, not, not, not weeks, uh, that calls for a warrant no matter how you do it. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, a little surprised that we've gone this far, this quickly on location data as well. Yeah, because um, that was the case that the United States versus Jones, and you know, historically we've had agents uh, follow cars, so tell that car, so barrel that car, and a lot of resources are spent doing that, but there's no warrant or report or anything required just to follow somebody. And so the question in that case was, we put a little device on the car, and therefore we don't have all these people following it, they get in traffic accidents, bad things happen, um, the court said, no, you need a warrant. It's, it's a, a reason why it's, you can't expect clarification from the Supreme Court anytime soon. The agents in the Jones case did get a warrant. They just got one from the wrong court. It was, it was out of jurisdiction. When the, when the car left the, the, the district where the warrant had been obtained, the, the, the warrant was, was, was no longer uh, uh, authoritative. Um, and, and so they, well, but you know, the agents, Federal agents in particular are very scrupulous about getting warrants when, when they think warrants are required. The state people in California now have to do that under the state statute. Where is the case going to come from that pushes the envelope on the ability to do warrantless location data? If I'm advising agents, I'm saying, look, you want to track location. You, you sell, you've, got a, you've got a drone that only has a two-hour battery. It's only two hours. Can we do it without a warrant? And, and my intuitive reaction to that is location data at this point requires a warrant if it's done by something other than human human uh, observation, uh, uh, why, you, you're risking the case if you, if you say, well, it's only two hours or it's only a day and a half or whatever. Um, and uh, if, if that's the way people think and they go ahead and get warrants even when the Supreme Court might not think they're required, and there's a lot of that that goes on, um, when is the case ever going to get to the Supreme Court that tells us uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, the third party doctrine generally is gone or or that the third party doctrine exception is only for location data or is only for digital storage devices. That case is going to take a long time to get to the Supreme Court, and it's got to start with somebody in law enforcement proceeding without a warrant in a borderline case. So, how about searching the interior of the car? We talked about if you want to track the car, you got to have a warrant. If you want to know where someone's phone was in the car, you have to have a warrant. But you don't need a warrant as long as you have probable cause to search inside of a car. Is that still true? Well, I, 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 it's the Ninth Circuit. Is it Camo? How do, how do they pronounce his name? Camo or Camo? Yeah. Um, uh, when you search the car uh, uh, pursuant to the vehicle exception to the to the search warrant requirement, where you can you know you can you know, search into the car, you've arrested somebody in the car, but even if the car is empty, even if it's totally unoccupied, you can search the car without a warrant if you have probable cause to think that evidence or contraband is in the car. So, classic cases: the dog alerts to. And indicates that there are drugs, illegal drugs in the car, that gives the, the, the agents the, the authority to search the vehicle without a warrant any place the drugs might be hidden. And the Camel case was about whether the cell phone in the car that's being searched under the vehicle exception is immune from warrantless search under the vehicle exception in the same way that it's immune from warrantless search under the search incident doctrine. And the Ninth Circuit said yes. Uh, and that, that ruling has not been challenged in other cases. I think it's a very straightforward application um, uh, of, of the Carpenter case, and uh, uh, I, 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 I have not seen the government challenging that ruling in other in other uh, circuits. So, so um, uh, with the digital is different qualification. Yeah, the car is different, and and this raises some questions, you know, some, some broader themes that are familiar to all of us um, uh, about race and class in the criminal justice system. Where do rich people have privacy in houses? Right? Where do poor people have privacy in cars? Um, and and uh, there's, there's an obvious wealth gap with a racially disparate impact there as to the ability of the police to, to conduct uh, warrantless uh, searches of, of, of motorists with the traffic stop followed by asking consent to search 
uh, with the with the, the, the traffic stop followed by the drug sniffing dog, or with Terry against Ohio, uh, suspicious driving slowly in a high crime area late at night, that kind of thing. Uh, and the burden of that kind of law enforcement falls disproportionately on people uh, who are not wealthy and who are not white. I've always thought this doctrine was very strange because, correct me if I'm wrong, Professor, but if I'm walking down the street with a briefcase, officers can't search it unless I have a warrant, correct? Yes. Unless they arrest me. So assume they don't arrest me, just walking down, they can't take it from me and search it. But if I put it in my car, and there's probable cause that there's something in my car, then they can search the briefcase. That was the Acevedo case, where he's walking with his paper bag out of the, out of the, out of the drug house, basically, and into his car. And, and they say, look, we need, we need rules for this. We have a lot of these cases, and the police need clear guidance. And the clear guidance is that while he's a pedestrian, you need a warrant to search his container. But as soon as he becomes a motorist, you don't. Um, and that you know, creates obvious incentive effects for the police to, to wait until the vehicle, given the cost of the warrant process that you just talked about. Now, in fairness, right, it does keep the police out of the house. Right? You can't do it. And people, police in, in, in private premises have some explaining to do. Uh, and and the, the, you know, the best explanation is we have a warrant. All the others um, are, are, are you know, raise eyebrows and people ask, well, well, maybe you were there for a while for a good purpose, you heard a gunshot or whatever, but how long were you in there and what were you looking for past a certain point? So, so um, uh, the rule is, is, is clear. You don't need a warrant for vehicles, even if it's another San Diego case, it's the Coney case, right, where it's a mobile home that's parked right across the street from the courthouse and you could have one officer watch the mobile home while another officer went in and found a judge. Uh, but it's a vehicle and we need to have bright line rules and you don't need a warrant to search a vehicle. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah. and we were talking mobile homes. Yes, that was uh, if it's readily mobile, then the warrant exception <coughs> applies. So, but it's your position not to put too fine a point on it. If someone leaves their cell phone in a car, you think Riley trumps and they still have to get a warrant to search that phone? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a camel case exactly. Um, is is that uh, whether you have probable cause to to deal with the phone in the vehicle, or whether you have search incident authority with respect to the person the phone is on the person. The digital device is just different, and you need to go get one. Well, we've got a couple more here. Uh, like I said, trash cans on the sidewalk. Uh, that's the old Greenwood case. That's still good law. And uh, you can find out a lot about someone from their garbage. Uh, trash runs. When you're reading Title III wiretaps, they always talk about trash runs did not reveal sufficient evidence. So that's one of the ways they... Yeah, but it, it, it depends on where the dumpster is. Right. So if the dumpster is although unlocked um, uh, outside his carport under the eaves, uh, and you have to walk onto the curtilage yes. of the house to get there, that's a trespass, and you don't want to do that. So, so um, sidewalk. sidewalk is okay. Yeah, once it, once it's abandoned, once it's been put out for collection, uh, then there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in it. Um, so uh, you, you see what happens when you get judge-made rules over a wide range of, of important issues is. Is they have some pretty arbitrary edges to them, and, and when, you know, we're used to living with that in the tax code, but in constitutional law, we, we like to see make some more principal distinctions. Uh, and, you know, and I realize um, one of the things I say at academic conferences is imagine the speakers that you've heard were the court, and um, how hard it would be to craft an opinion that you get five of the participants to agree on. Uh, it's a committee, it's subject to the laws of collective decision, arrows and possibility theorem, and so on. And, and uh, you know, is glass half full or half empty? Should we be amazed at how many times there are uh, uh, arbitrary uh, inconsistencies in the decision of law? Or should we be amazed that there aren't many more arbitrary inconsistencies in the decision of law than there are? Uh, we talked about credit cards and phone records. I always found these to be very, very helpful. Uh, Professor, you spoke about the aggregation of information, certainly in the phone number. You know, you think about what you can do with phone numbers and who, who someone is texting or who someone, without even getting content, just the numbers. It's getting worse. You know these discount club cards at the Vaughn's and the Ralph's and stuff, right? What they, what they, they want your information for each purchase so they can target you for coupons and boss leaders and that kind of thing. But what that means is that Visa or whatever, or your debit card company, they know how much you spend at the Vaughn's. But the Vaughn's knows every item you purchase there. Uh, and some people use the pharmacy at the Vaughn's, right? Uh, and the Walgreens has similar information for their points club too and so forth. Uh, and so, so now we're not talking about just how much money you spend and where, but exactly what you spend it on down to uh, what, what brand of liquor you favor, if you favor it. 
um, uh, 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 how many, you know, how, you said you quit smoking. Well, no, you really didn't quit smoking because you bought three, three cartons on your last trip, um, and so on and so forth. That, that is really uh, data that can be aggregated to a point where you know um, an awful lot about the person's life, uh, even though you haven't invaded their house. And as of right now, the law still is a court Supreme Court. Subpoena is always required. I, I, I re choose not to extend Smith and Miller. As, I imagine that sentence got worked on um, for more hours than we have spent here today. Um, uh, and that sentence, I think, means what it says, that Smith and Miller are a good law until we up here on Olympus tell you they're not. Um, and uh, in the meantime, um, you need a warrant for the digital devices. Uh, what, what happens if your credit card records are on your phone? I actually had a case one time where one of our defendants actually was waiting at an alien smuggling drop-off point, and he actually went into bonds and used his card, and the receipt had his name on it. That's how we were able to tie him to the scene of the crime. So you know, be careful using that bonds card. Well, you know, the, the footprint we all leave every day, everywhere we go, uh, by people capturing our image, uh, creating receipts that have the time and the date that you made a purchase. Um, I had a counter case involving the passing of counterfeit currency, and the receipts from the stores where the people were cashing the checks allowed had the time and date stamp, and when they got those receipts, they were able to go back and get the video from the store, and you could see the defendants when they entered the store, when they left the store, which tied them personally to the receipts. So we are surveilled unknowingly, not by the police, but every day, everywhere we go, just walking down the street, there's video capturing you, and with tiny pieces of information, you can put so much together about, again, your movements, where you've been, what you've done, much of which still will not file one. Um, it's not like the credit card doesn't give location data. It just, right. it just doesn't give it as comprehensively as the tracking device. That's a very, very thin, very thin distinction. Um, one, one, good, one, good, one good piece of news, if you want some good news about all this, it has never been easier for innocent people to clear themselves. I'm not going to go into the drone surveillance, but uh, because the Supreme Court hasn't reached that issue yet, but I was curious in terms of you were talking about how long you're following someone uh, might be important to whether or not you need a warrant because you're not collecting, just sitting outside someone's house and catching them in the moment coming and going, but rather you're tracking your movements. Uh, of course, you all use those pole cameras, which you can put on someone's house, and so it's not so much a length, perhaps, of geographic. The drone might be able to follow you, not, you know, drone hovering over your house, I guess, would become obvious after a while, but it could also follow you. Or get two levels of an invasion of privacy that's beyond just the front door of the garage. Well, the carpenter case is about location data without a trespass. So I think that case covers drones, even though it isn't a drone case, right? It's giving you the location data. It's not giving you photography, so that's different. But it is giving you the location data without having done anything physical to the car. Uh, and that says the Supreme Court in the Carpenter case, you need a warrant to do that, uh, at least if it's more than three days. Now, I think that raises interesting questions about these pole cameras. If you set it up outside a person's residence and they go in, and then they don't come out for five days, haven't you generated five days of location data? Um, and if it's five days of location data, that calls for a warrant on the Carpenter case. Um, so, so uh, I, I, I'm not, not sure that that motion has been has been made, um, but but uh, it's coming. There are some federal defenders in the back. I saw. So, uh, <laughs> that's that's all right. Yeah, I think that that wraps up the presentation. Um, yeah, no, we talk about no warrant required, et cetera. <laughs> But now we can, I think it's about five o'clock. Do you want to open up for some questions? Sure. Yes, Martha. Well, it sounds to me, uh, like you think that the, it sounds to me like you think that's the first time someone said that. <laughs> that you think that the third party doctrine is on its way out because of the way that you can aggregate all of this information and the breadth and depth of the information that's available. I, I don't know um, what's going to happen. The current doctrine is clearly unstable. Um, uh, it, it, if, if you say third party, um, uh, now and forever, one inseparable, 
Um, if you, Justice Thomas's position that we should just scrap cats altogether and go back to atomistic rights to exclude people from our private premises and not to be arrested and that kind of thing. If, 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 you, if you take the extreme third party view, then text message and email content are fair game without warrants from the service provider. No majority of the Supreme Court is going to do that. So, so there's never going to be a third party to the bitter end principled adherence to the third party doctrine praying on our knees that Congress will fix this. That's not going to persuade five justices on the Supreme Court, in my humble opinion. And so that means the third party doctrine is never going to be pure. Right? Uh, and the question is how many reasonable expectations of privacy are going to survive transfer to an intermediary or trustee? Uh, and we, we know that communications are going to survive. And we know that location data is going to survive. Um, what more? Right. What more? Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think it's very hard to distinguish the credit card case in particular from the cell phone case. Um, whether changes in personnel, it's, we're all grown-ups, right? We know that politics influences the Supreme Court. We know that personnel changes influence the outcome of Supreme Court litigation. Um, uh, what direction that's going to go in this particular context? Come back to Justice Alito and his compact discs, right? Not the person you would think. Uh, to be insisting on the mosaic theory that reasonable expectations of privacy against government acquisition of this stuff um, are, are, are um, something that survives transfer to third parties. You wouldn't necessarily expect that from ideology, but that's what he said. So, so uh, um, uh, the short answer is I don't know. I think they may be hoping that Congress takes this albatross off their neck uh, in, in some comprehensive way, like the California legislature did, um, but life is what happens while we're making other plans, and cases are going to come before the Supreme Court that are going to raise these questions. Was that, are there any uh, cases, either coming before the Supreme Court or in the pipeline, that we should keep an eye on? The only thing that's cooking at SCOTUS this term is uh, dual sovereign uh, exception to the double jeopardy clause, the Gamble case. Uh, I don't think there's anything search and seizure-ish going on and, and nothing, I don't, the, the case that they will probably get next is a really hard case, which is along the lines of the Cotterman decision in the Ninth Circuit or the, Co I can't pronounce the fellow's name, uh, in the Fourth Circuit, which is what about digital devices and the border search exception? Uh, and, and so you're going to have a, an investment banker coming in from London who doesn't like having his laptop searched by an ICE agent who may well be a day trader on, on Saturdays, right? Um, uh, and, and, but so, so what, what you know, is, is the cursory, where in the Fourth Amendment is the distinction between cursory inspection and forensic examination, and remote from, all of that is judge-made law to accommodate uh, legitimate governmental interests at the border. What you do with the digital is different doctrine. When you get there, may very well come out differently. Um, uh, than, than uh, uh, vehicle exception searches, for instance, um, uh, where I think there's a straightforward application of the Carpenter case at the border, all bets are off. Uh, and that's probably the case that's going to come up next, and I have no idea how that's going to come up. Martin? Yes, how about the use of uh, cell tower simulators? Yeah, so the cell tower simulator acts like a cell tower and sucks in your signal. So among other things, I, I believe the technology allows the people who use it to get content. Right? Um, uh, among other things. So, so uh, the cases, uh, with one case on that, um, uh, very early, uh, I think it may have been a state case, and the court said you need a warrant for that. Um, obviously, after the Carpenter case, that's a done deal, but there was an analogy to the Jones case and that it's kind of trespassory, right? You're intercepting the, the transmission and you don't have a right to do that. Um, uh, and so, so uh, that was something that you needed a warrant for even before the Carpenter case. But what if you don't use it for get the information that only because you, let's say you're in an apartment complex, and you want to look, you want to find the apartment where that cell phone is located because the suspect that's on the investigation is the one that has that phone. And you use that cell, that cell tower simulator to pinpoint to the exact apartment where that person is. Well, that would be, so the argument would be it's just location data, but it's, 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 it's rifle shot location data. Is that the argument? Yeah, just for the location. Right, so, so, um, uh, I, I, I think you've now got a problem with another case, which is the Kylo case. Lights. Um, right, so, so you're revealing things that are inside the house that could not have been observed without an entry in 1791, and so uh, under the, I, you know, I, 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 just, I just 
read stuff that's in the reports. It's not me. So, um, uh, so, so that I think, would, you know, if, if it's in his house, right? If you're looking for a chattel inside his house with electronic means, I think that calls for a warrant on the Kylo case. I mean, there is there is this notion in the Carpenter case that if if you want to get the the phones that were in contact with the tower next to the bank that was robbed an hour on either side, you don't need a warrant for that. And and then if you've got some other things that put your guy at the scene, now you're in business. If you find his, his phone in contact with those towers uh, in the immediate uh, uh, time vicinity of the crime. I think we need to wrap up. Final thought, carrying up on time. Judge Owen's comment, if you live your life online and you share with your friends, your expectation of privacy from your parents and law enforcement may not be what you thought it was, and so you might be careful. Um, I'm sure that the professor would be happy to take some questions when we conclude here, but I'd like to thank them both for their time today.